Alright guys, welcome back to another episode of the Fairly Lame Podcast. My name is Dom, and here each and every week we go over positive, feel-good environmental news from all around the world. And I think this week in particular, looking at some uh, recent events and whatnot that's been going on uh, in the great land of America... um, you know, we'll try to look at uh, some of the good stuff that's happening out there to try to not offset it, but you know, there is there is a lot of good news out there. Uh, just sometimes uh, some not too good decisions are made, but <laughs> enough on that, enough on that. We'll keep that out of here. Uh, but also this episode, we'll try to keep a little shorter. Last week we went for about 40 minutes, um, try to aim for about 20 minutes. We'll see how we go, but yeah, we'll get straight into it. And as always, all the links for these stories down below uh, if you want to go read some more, whatever, and also all the timestamps. So if you want to skip to a particular story of interest, feel free to do so. So our first story for today is looking at how drones and artificial intelligence are being used to protect elephants and prevent conflict with humans. Then the wild bloom event in the Chilean desert, which led to the creation of a new national park. And the proposed Great Koala National Park, which would protect over 315,000 hectares of koala habitat in northern New South Wales. And how a tiny village of 200 people are playing a crucial role in the conservation of the three-banded armadillo. And over 500,000 endangered olive ridley sea turtles have arrived at an Indian marine sanctuary to lay their millions of eggs. And finally, what a medical student from Florida International University learnt from doing a placement at Zoo Miami. So yeah, to get us underway, we'll be having a look at how new AI-powered drone technology aids elephant conservation. Drones are being developed that are equipped with a novel artificial intelligence system to track elephants in their natural habitat, and they're already being deployed in East Africa. And so Panetta, who's from this university team behind this incredible work, say her and her lab have been working for years on using drones to aid in disaster recovery, assessing the damage from the sky. She was approached about four years ago by members of the Elephant Conservation Alliance from her university who asked if the drones could be used to aid wildlife conservation. Intrigued by the opportunity to expand the uses of her research, she jumped at the idea. So Panetta and her team developed an AI-equipped drone that recognises individual elephants from images even when those images are dark, seen from afar, or otherwise difficult for conservationists to use effectively. Knowing where specific elephants are can help wildlife conservationists determine ideal habitats and keep animals safe from interactions with humans, which can be deadly. Individual elephants from afar and even when it's dark. It does get a bit stranger. There's a couple more questions that come up, but just keep that in mind. They're not trying to just identify an elephant from a bloody rabbit. They're trying to the exact uh, individual. And so since elephants frequently travel at night, the AI is trained to identify elephants with thermal imaging, a method that detects elephants' body heat. So I don't know, I'm assuming, surely there's got to be no way to tell the difference between two individuals by looking at their body heat. Unless, like, unless you're looking at the outline, but even then, I don't know, surely at that stage, surely using thermal imaging, you're already taking a step back, you know what I mean? Like, you're not, surely... But a second year doctoral student in the lab says that the team has had huge success identifying elephants in crowded images and in the dark. The lab's technology can also collect data on individual elephant health by identifying skin infections, changing in the elephant's size or altered behavior. And they also say the drones might also deter poaching because the poachers will recognize drones as signs of human presence and hopefully avoid the area. Panetta says drone tracking is more humane for the elephants than other strategies, like attaching radio collars, which can interfere with the elephant's natural behaviors. The current approach for elephants now is quite invasive. We're trying to track migration patterns with a very non-invasive approach. Our approach from the beginning was saying that whatever we do, we cannot alter the elephants physically. That was really important. And so part of the non-invasive approach includes identifying elephants on a first name basis from afar. All elephants, he says, looks quite similar, especially when they're free from markings like spots or stripes, which can help conservationists identify individuals from other mammal species. Right now, only people who have worked directly with the elephants know them well enough to differentiate them. And see, this is where my question comes from. If even, even if it's just two elephants in daylight up close, only the people who have worked closely with them are able to identify them. Surely, surely they can't be identified using thermal heat. I don't know. What do you guys reckon? And so they're hoping to improve identification by using characteristics like tears in ears, head size, and tusk shape and orientation, among other things that differ between individual elephants. They can use that information to train the AI to match those characteristics to elephant names. And so this is a bit like I did a little, uh, uh, what do you call it? experience, a little um, dolphin dive experience down here in Melbourne in uh, Port Phillip Bay. It was a bit strange. Um, you like go on a boat and you just drive and the dolphins 
like the pressure at the front of the boat. And so the dolphins just like out of nowhere came up and they were swimming and whatnot. And then it was pitched as like a go like snorkel with dolphins out in the wild, which it was. But at the same time, it was like they had these massive ropes out the back. And then we'd just be sitting on the back with like snorkels, wet, wetties and whatnot. And then they just go like, now, now. <laughs> so everyone jumps out of, the, out of the boat, hangs onto these ropes. And then the dolphins like came back and like swam behind us and like through us. And then they were up the front again and they were gone and we we're constantly doing that. Anyway, in that program, they, or in that um, company, whatever, tour guides, they had, uh, they were able to identify the dolphins down here in Melbourne. Apparently heaps of them could have been lying to us. Who knows? But cause some have different, uh, nicks and scratches and whatnot, uh, from old battles and old war wounds. Um, so yeah, it sounds like a pretty, uh, common technique. And so this is where I don't know if they're trying to make it sound like it's going better than it is. Because he, <laughs> he went on to say that it's a tricky task. Uh, current monitoring technology has only about a 56% success rate, but we're positive we can do way better than that. But then at the start, they were talking about how like amazing this is going. So I don't know, maybe 56 is good. I don't know. It doesn't sound amazing. But I mean, look, this, it's, still, it's still good news. I'm just saying maybe some of these details need to be uh, ironed out a bit. But the team hopes that the technology they've developed could also start to be implemented for the conservation of other species. For example, they say that the AI could be particularly well suited to tracking rhinos. And to Panetta, the possible applications of AI are limitless for helping humans and animals prepare for the unexpected, like a band of poachers or a change in elephant migration patterns. There are so many different scenarios that we as humans can't even begin to create experiments for. AI allows us to do that. And for some nice little background, should have done this earlier, but we're here now. So African elephants are the world's largest land mammals, with males on average reaching up to 3 metres in height and weighing up to 6 tonnes. And they're in a spot of bother, so following population declines over several decades due to poaching uh, for ivory and loss of habitat, the African forest elephant is now listed as critically endangered, and the savanna elephant is also listed as endangered. And so that work was going on in East Africa, I believe they said, which is home to 20% of the African elephant populations. And there's another article we'll have a quick look at uh, about preventing conflict between elephants and humans. But before we do that, why are elephants so important? So elephants play an essential role in their environment, their landscape architects. For instance, as they move around and feed, they create clearings in wooded areas, which lets new plants grow and forests naturally regenerate. And they're also important for seed dispersal. So when elephants eat seed bearing plants and fruits, the seeds often re-emerge undigested and it's the way a lot of plants spread. And elephants can eat big seeds that small animals can't. There you go. And so this is another article looking at how AI can be used to prevent human-elephant conflict. And so this one is called Wild Eyes AI. And so the system involves small cameras that work remotely, hidden in a tree above the reach of elephants. And when the camera's motion sensor is triggered, it uses computer vision to detect elephants in the frame and transmit those images in near real time to the cell phones of village guardians. And then the hope is that by alerting these village guardians, they'll be able to detect elephants and transmit signal alerts to wildlife managers and communities to prevent conflict situations before they occur. And so as these cameras filter on the edge, which apparently just means transmitting only true positives, uh, the camera conserves vital battery life. And due to their low power requirements, Wild Eyes AI can run for more than 1.5 years on a single charge of its rechargeable lithium ion battery, previously unheard of for a field based sensor. These images of the elephants can be sent over GSM, which is like a global, what was it? Global, global system. The global system for mobile communications is a standard developed by the European telecommunications. Just a way to send whatever. Um, and so it can either be sent over a GSM network or a long range radio link in areas without cell connectivity in under two minutes from the camera to the internet and back to the local guardians completing the loop. And so with this prior knowledge that the elephants may be approaching, the villagers and rangers will be able to respond before elephants raid crops, destroy homes or endanger local villages by using traditional acoustic techniques to scare elephants away or strengthening physical barriers around the fields. And for our next story, so a new national park in Chile will protect 141,000 acres of biodiverse ecosystem in the Atacama Desert, where a rare super bloom paints one of the world's most barren places with red, magenta and marigold wildflowers. Last October's impressive display, the first in five years, inspired the government to form North Chile's sick national park, the Desierto Florido. And apologies for the rest of this article. If I mispronounce anything, I definitely do not mean to. Uh, if um, anyone's able to inform me better, give me some clues uh, or some tips, 
Greatly appreciated. So the Atacama, the world's driest non-polar desert, brims with blooms that sprout every three to ten years. The insects and birds that rely on them, and the microorganisms that flourish in the zone's harsh, hyper-arid core. And many of these microbes hold clues about survival on an increasingly arid Earth, as well as the potential for life beyond it. And so the 600-mile-long Atacama is wedged between the Pacific Ocean and the Andes Mountains, both of which shield the desert's core from precipitation. It's nearly 50 times drier than Death Valley, and some some weather stations there are yet to record a drop of rain. And in the last 40 years, the Atacama has seen an estimated 15 super blooms. The phenomenon typically follows El Nino's warm weather, where the winter rains strip the protective coat from the dormant seeds, which leads to their blossoming. The magnitude of October's bloom surprised scientists since it occurs after lower than usual temperatures. And apparently there's still lots to learn about chili super bloom, as little is known about the eco-evolutionary process that the Desierto Florido flowering desert triggers, such as how plants have involved to guarantee pollination during the rare and short blooming period. And so while preserving these blooms is important for the region's ecosystems, Chilean microbiologist Christina Dorador says protection should extend to the critical species we can't see, the microorganisms. In the northern desert's hyper-arid core, microorganisms get savvy. They nestle inside rocks and survive off minuscule water droplets from overnight fog. It's a microhabitat. There's a whole ecosystem inside of a rock. These microscopic adaptations can teach us a lot, including lessons about life on the red planet. And so to wrap it up, the Atacamas cause crusty salt flats and rugged valleys don't just look Martian. In a way, they are. Apparently, the soil chemistry is quite similar. And that's why astrobiologists research Atacamas' highly adaptable species to understand if life could exist elsewhere in the universe. And so this is also on Nat Geo, and they went on to say that this stuff also happens in America, but at the moment, it's almost exclusively in state or national parks, especially in desert regions, including Death Valley, Anza Borrego, Joshua Tree, and the Arid Caribbean. Rizzo Plain, uh, where flowers emergence contrast spectacularly with the subdued dry phase landscapes. And a nice way to wrap it up, so even in the driest drought, deserts aren't wastelands, but a flower miracle waiting to happen. The seeds that feed the blooms are always present in the soil by the billions, just waiting sometimes for decades for the right conditions. And so before we get into this next story, as we all know by now, Fairly Lame is now supported by 4Ocean. If you're not familiar, they're an amazing organisation working to clean up the world's ocean and so far have removed almost 30 million pounds of plastic from the ocean. I think I said pounds, but we're going to roll with it. So this month, each month they have a cause in particular. It might be an ecosystem, could be a species. This month, it's all about puffins, right? Everyone's favourite bloody seabirds. Shout out puffin books, uh from the good old days. And so Puffin's biggest threats are climate change, which is partly fueled by the plastic industry. If you want to learn more, they've got a whole page on their website going about the threats and even the ecology and behavior of these species. There's four species of Puffins. I didn't know that. Shout out the great... um horned puffin it's got a bloody horn sticking out of its beak um, but yeah if you use the affiliate link down in the description and the code fairly lame all one word you can get 20 percent off everything not just these bracelets which are potentially one of the sexiest pieces of uh or accessories the world has ever seen but they've also got beach cleanup equipment uh, or sustainable alternatives like they've got um metal cups uh, they've also got reusable cutlery, uh, cleaning stuff, all that amazing stuff. Link down in the bio. And uh, yes, support them, support the podcast, and helps clean up the bloody oceans. And for our next good story, we're having a look at the proposed Great Koala National Park up in northern New South Wales, which, if it goes ahead, would protect over 300,000 hectares of koala habitat. I'm doing an interview with uh, Great Forest National Park, which is a national park down here in Melbourne, actually after this. And I'm not sure who got the name first, Great Koala or Great Forest. Um, But yeah, both doing incredible things and both two, might I add, have very similar numbers like down for Great Forest in Melbourne. At the moment, there's 170,000 hectares protected. They want to get it to 355. And here uh, at the moment, there's 140,000 protected. They want to get to 315. Name similar. I don't know if they're in uh, cahoots, as they say. Um, but yeah, we'll have a look what it could mean for the endangered, the recently endangered koala. So the Great Koala National Park would protect a total of 315,000 hectares of koala habitat on public lands. 140,000 is currently protected as conservation reserves, while the remaining 175,000 hectares are currently classified as state forests. State forests are a critical part of the proposal, containing much of the best koala habitat in the region. And so New South Wales government mapping of koala habitat 
confirms that the Great Koala National Park proposal would protect the most important koala habitat in the region. And importantly, the proposal would protect koalas in five local government areas and does not include any plantation forest or private land. And so a gateway visitor center is proposed south of Coffs Harbour on the Pacific Highway adjacent to the Bongil Bongil National Park. Uh, it will provide visitor information, a gum bay in gear, apologies, uh, cultural information, uh, a cafe, educational spaces, and a koala hospital. The centre will also be a launch point for various park activities like koala spotting tours, indigenous cultural tours, and trail hiking. Again, I've, I've brought up koala spotting before. Absolutely impossible. Cannot see the bloody tree rats. Super hard. Super hard. But that, that sounds sick, though. And so why do we need it? Why do we need this national park? Why do we need this protection? So for some background, not going to dwell on it too much. So... Their numbers are dwindling fast. The numbers of the koalas aren't looking amazing. So they dropped by a third between 1990 and 2010. And on top of this, it's estimated that the 2019-2020 bushfires killed over 70% of the remaining koalas in the North Coast area. And they're now officially endangered. And so national parks apparently aren't enough. Most New South Wales koalas are actually living outside of protected areas like national parks. And this is because our national parks are mostly made up of higher, less fertile country instead of the lush coastal forests that koalas need to thrive. And I think I touched on this a couple of podcasts ago. And it's kind of like, you got to think about why areas haven't been... Uh, Utilize, you know what I mean? Like there's a there's often a reason why a forest hasn't been cut down yet or a place is a natural or a nature reserve is because it's not the most productive and it couldn't be used for agriculture, whether it's too rocky, too steep, soil's not that good. So obviously that sways the species you can protect and apparently the koala is one of them. And the Great Koala National Park would link some of these coastal areas with existing national parks so the koalas can access the food they need as well as move freely in response to extreme weather events. So I'm not too much of a numbers guy, but we'll go into the economics. So because the proposed forest areas are already publicly owned, this is a cheap option. In comparison to buy this size land of private farmland, it would cost between $1.2 and $2.5 billion. So the Great Koala National Park would give us maximum koala habitat for the minimum cost. And then obviously, if you're protecting an area this big, like 315,000 hectares, uh, obviously you're not just going to protect koalas, you're going to protect like, everything else in the ecosystem. So there are many other threatened and endangered species that would also be protected, including old growth and hollow dependent species, such as yellow belly gliders, greater gliders, powerful owls, sooty owls, master owls, barking owls, Jesus Christ, and the glossy black cockatoos. And this is bringing up some interesting memories. So uh, I've only seen one powerful owl out in the wild. And it was when I had to do some field work uh, for a subject in first year or something. We had to go do some quadrats, surveying different vegetation types in a national park, something like that. Um, and I was with a couple, uh, <laughs> couple old flames and whatnot in the group, right? Um, and anyway, and so we're walking through. And then we look up and like, it's this dense, like swampy, like just low tree coverage. Can't really see much, real dark. And you just look up and there's this massive owl with its big bloody head and creepy eyes just looking directly at you, looking into your soul. And it's just been watching us the whole time. And it was probably like five meters away. It was terrifying. Those things are massive and their claws, they could probably pick me up. I reckon two of them could pick me up and fly me out of bloody, fly me back to Canberra, honestly, honestly. And so... As with all national park proposals, like the um, the Great Forest National Park, there's obviously going to be certain people against it who have uh, interests and whatnot um, and recreation activities. And so apparently, we'll start with the good stuff. So this is on ABC too, by the way. So uh, it's predicted that the park would generate $412 million from the visitors as well as create 9,810 full-time equivalent jobs. And it's important that it says equivalent so it's not going to be exactly, you know, a couple casual, or not a couple casual, a few hundred thousand, not a few hundred thousand, a few thousand uh, casual seasonal staff, whatever part-time staff. Um, so it's not all full-time, but it still is a hell of a lot of jobs. And obviously, uh, forestry industry is not too happy about that. And they just went on to say that state forest native logging would be hard hit uh, and we could see around 675 jobs axed in the region. And then Timber New South Wales said that job losses would exceed 1,500 and that the move would cost the region's economy at least $700 million a year, which sounds like a lot, a lot, especially again, like different projects. I don't know if it's just a name, but especially when you consider that the Great Forest National Park, the timber 
industry down there it was the same issue native logging or whatever that was only bringing in 12 million uh, oh no obviously different situations but 12 million to 700 million seems mental and I, or I guess it's I guess it's cost the local economy, so it's not all, you know, top line revenue or whatever. It's like the indirect and like the people coming here for work and spending money. But still, that does sound like a lot. What What do you guys reckon? Do you reckon seven hundred million? I don't know. And for our next story, we'll have a look at how this tiny village in Brazil are playing a crucial role in the protection and conservation of the three banded armadillo. Uh, again, apologies before we get into this. I feel like I can already see a couple words popping out that I'm going to absolutely butcher. Apologies in advance. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, yeah, please let me know if, if uh, you can give me some pointers or whatnot because I think, especially Brazil, seems to come up a lot in the podcast. And so endemic to Brazil, the Brazilian uh, three-banded armadillo is a species native to the Caatinga, a semi-arid dry forest ecosystem in the country's northeast, but it can also be found in the savannas of the Cerrado. Feeding on termites and ants, the armadillo has an excellent sense of smell as it teeters on its enormous claws, combing the landscape in search of its prey. In Portuguese, the species is known as a tattoo bola or the ball armadillo as it rolls itself into a complete ball when threatened, a defense mechanism that bewilders and discourages smaller predators. And so our beloved ball armadillo is unfortunately listed as vulnerable by the IUCN uh, and is threatened by several factors, including land degradation, uh, driven by cattle ranching slash and burn agriculture, cotton cultivation and timber and charcoal extraction, which has reduced the armadillo's habitat by about half of its original forest cover. And so today, less than 8% of the biome is formally protected under the Brazilian National uh, Nature Reserve legislation, and only 1.3 receives full legal protection. And so this is where we learn about this incredible village literally doing the Lord's work. So, nestled in the rugged terrain of the Bahia's Chapada, Diamantina Mountains, apologies again, in northeastern Brazil, the remote village of Sumiduro is home to a little more than 200 people. Despite its size, Sumiduro is the first place to use citizen science and community-based conservation to protect the Brazilian three-banded armadillo. So they first started a monitoring program for the armadillo in the village as a part of a general biodiversity survey for the environmental licensing of a wind farm. Since the project's inception, the community has played a crucial role in collecting valuable data on the armadillo species in the area. Local field assistants monitor the animal in and around agricultural land and forest fragments, while village residents report armadillo sightings to the project's database, providing photos and GPS coordinates. Combining this data with a statistical technique known as occupancy modeling, shout out my honors project, go watch the vlog, go watch the honors vlog. Uh, the uh, this allows the researchers to build a comprehensive picture of the armadillo's occurrence and movements. There is actually relatively little knowledge of how this species utilizes habitat in human modeling modified landscapes, yet this kind of data is essential for effectively conserving the species. And so we touched on how this whole monitoring started because a wind farm was going to be built. Well, it was finally constructed in 2009, and the new employment opportunities from the wind farm have improved the residents' living standards, which then reduced the reliance on slash and burn agriculture in the area and curbed habitat loss. And with the wind farms also came more police. Heightened law enforcement discouraged illegal hunting, which resulted in more protection for the armadillo. Some of the oldest cave paint paintings in the Americas can be found in the northeast of Brazil and many depict armadillos. So the association between humans and armadillos clearly dates back to ancient times. And the armadillo has become a symbol of local pride in the area with residents saying we really didn't have much of an understanding about the armadillo and its importance before, but we are conscious now of preserving the flora and fauna of the area. We gain so much more by preserving this animal than by killing it. That's why we've embraced this cause and hope it will bring visibility to our community. If you thought it couldn't get any better, you've been fooled because definitely can because after more than a decade after the economic shift when the wind farm came in the reduction in hunting pressures has given the armadillo much needed respite the researchers are beginning to see signs suggesting the species is on the road to recovery nowadays it's getting much easier to find and the decrease in hunting is paying off we've seen the armadillo multiply over time and what our research shows is the potential that this species has to not only survive in human modified environments but even to become common provided that hunting and habitat loss are tackled through the inclusion of local communities in conservation. So before we get into these last few stories, could you please make sure to head over to Instagram and TikTok at fairly lame underscore because that's the home of my daily news show, right? So it goes for about 60 seconds a minute, uh, Monday to Friday, where we look at good environmental news from all around the world, but 
all the stories are completely different to the ones that we look on uh, on the podcast, right? So we're trying to keep it separate. So we're not repeating myself as bloody five days a week. So yeah, head over there for more good news and a whole heap of bloody really cute animal content as well. But anyway, back to the good news. And for our next story, so Olive Ridley sea turtle nesting has begun with over 500,000 turtles laying eggs in four days at an Indian sanctuary. So as many as 503,719 turtles laid eggs in the last four days on the tranquil beaches of the sanctuary in Kendrapara district, uh, the world's largest rookery of sea turtles. And this number is also higher than last season when 501,175 turtles laid their eggs. Imagine being the poor bloke who had to count 500,000 turtles. The five kilometer stretch on the two tiny islands make for a proper nesting site for the turtles since there are no predators or human habitation there. The phenomenon continues for roughly a week and the eggs hatch in around 45 days. After this span, the tiny hatchlings come out and make their way to the sea. And around 40 forest officials, including forest guards, are guarding the nesting sites and the sea to protect the turtles and their eggs. The state government imposed a ban on fishing activities inside the sanctuary from November 1 through May 31st to protect the turtles. And for some context, so the Olive Ridley turtle are protected under the Wildlife Act of 1972 as a vulnerable or endangered animal. And so this is this is bloody mind blowing. So we already had over 500,000 turtles come to lay eggs. How many eggs do they lay? Females on average lay 109 large round eggs. What's that add up to? I don't even know. What does that add up to? 54 million. 54 million baby, if they all hatch, 54 million baby turtles on a five kilometer stretch of beach. That's mental. And for our last story, we'll have a look at how this Florida International University medical student ended up doing a placement at Zoo Miami. So the bloke Michael Valenti graduated from FIU's uh, College of Medicine in April and next month he starts his residency training in pediatrics at a children's hospital in Orlando. And so on the first day of his last medical school rotation, he got a call that a patient was en route to the hospital uh, who was just a few months old had fallen and appeared unable to put weight on her left leg. After a quick physical exam, we proceeded to take x-rays. While looking at the films, I was struck by how translucent the bones were in our patient's leg. Surely she must have some metabolic disease resulting in poorly developed bone tissue. Nope, birds just have air in their bones to help them fly. And it turns out that patient was a flamingo that called Zoo Miami home. Over the next four weeks, he had the privilege to learn from the world-class animal health team at Zoo Miami, not just about the differences between the anatomy, physiology, and diseases of animals and humans, but importantly, the similarities and relationships between the two and areas for future collaboration. This approach is known as One Health that recognizes the health of people is closely related to that of animals and the shared environment. And so he's always been passionate about conservation and zoology. Uh, and so he just reached out to Zoo Miami, which led to my first question, like, surely this had to be done before. Like, surely you can't just be like, oh, well, I'm interested in it. So I'm going to use my medical degree to help tigers, you know what I mean? And so he reached out to Zoo Miami to set up a pilot medical school rotation, which was met with immediate enthusiasm from the zoo's chief of animal health, who embraced the idea of setting up a clerkship that would bring medical students to the zoo to learn through experience, reading, and discussion about the animal health field. During his rotation, he assisted in surgeries on a flamingo, owls, and lizards, physicals on a Florida panther, an otter, and an anaconda, and a magnitude of other procedures and exams involving many other animals at Zoo Miami. And as a future pediatrician, he said he found a highlight in participating in assessments of a juvenile giant ant eater named Ziggy born prematurely. The team monitored his growth milestones in much the same way pediatricians follow the growth of human babies. Beyond such practical experiences, the readings and discussions with the animal health team challenged him to think about One Health topics like zoonotic diseases, climate change, and ecological food chains, and to identify areas for collaboration between the fields. And I did some more reading and it turns out this has been done before. There's a couple examples on this website if you want to have a look again always link below. This is on Science News Explores. And so a chimpanzee named Pandora changed the way that physician Barbara Nattison Horowitz thought about practicing medicine. Veterinarians at the Los Angeles Zoo in California were worried Pandora had a heart problem, but the zoo did not have the medical tools it needed to study the chimpanzee's heart, but a human hospital would. So the zoo doctors contacted Horowitz, a cardiologist and professor of medicine who works at the University of California, Los Angeles, not far from the zoo. So a lot of the time, 
she's having to do ultrasounds on human heart. And later on, Horowitz was asked to ultrasound a gorilla's heart. And soon she was looking at the hearts of lions, tamarins, and other animals. The more animals she saw, the more she talked with the vets. I heard about animals with diabetics, breast cancer, obesity. The list went on and on. She had not grown up with pets in her home and it opened her eyes to how many diseases I was taking care of in human beings that also happened in animals. And she went on to say that learning about diseases in other animals can help doctors take better care of animals and people. This cross-species approach to animal and human health is called One Medicine or One Health as we looked at before. This approach is not new. Some of the greatest discoveries in medicine have come from studying diseases in both people and animals. For example, a virus that infected cows and people led to the vaccine for smallpox, the only human disease ever completely wiped out. So that's it for episode 29 of the Fairly Lame podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know down below your thoughts and over on Instagram if you're listening audio only. Uh, yeah, make sure to head over to Instagram and uh, TikTok to follow during the week between podcast episodes and to get clips from the podcast too. See you over there. Have a fantastic rest of the day and we'll see you later.